Greetings, sisters and brothers, on this Easter Sunday, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. The title of our message for this Easter of 2020 is God, who is love, always wins. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, 
O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And sisters and brothers, I invite you to read today's gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18, when Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. So, God who is love always wins. I am almost 60 years old, and I can tell you in all truthfulness, I have never experienced a holy week like this one. And I talk to people who are even older than I am who say they have never seen anything like this Holy Week. Uh, if I were to have this church full of people today, I would do a children's sermon. And my children's sermon would be based on the story of the Grinch who tried to steal Christmas, but of course could not. And I would give it an Easter twist. Of course, in the Christmas story, the Grinch hates Christmas, hates the joy and the love of the people of Whoville. And so he thinks that if he steals all of the external accoutrements of, of Christmas, takes all the presents, all the decorations, even all the food from their great feast, that the people will not celebrate Christmas. Christmas morning, he's watching from his, his uh, haunt above the town, and he's ready to hear wailing and moaning and, and sounds of lament when instead the people of Whoville come out, form a circle, join hands, and sing their joyful Christmas song. And he realizes that Christmas is not about all of the external stuff Christmas is about God's gift of love, and love, God who is love, always wins. And experiencing that, witnessing that, even made the Grinch's heart expand. So this Easter, we need to remember this whole Holy Week. We remembered that Holy Week is not about the external accoutrements of, of Holy Week. It's not about all the external things. It's about God who is love and who, whose love always wins. And so even in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, when we are told we cannot gather and we cannot worship, that does not stop love. That does not stop us from worshiping in our homes. So I sent a guide to Holy Week to every home with practices we can do on our own. And so beginning with Palm Sunday, you know, okay, we can't hand out palms. So I took all the palms and a friend and I put them in all of our gardens and decorated all around the church. So everyone who walked or drove by was reminded it is Palm Sunday. Love always wins. God who is love always wins. Tuesday of Holy Week, um, a little two and a half girl, year old girl from our congregation, Adeline, her mom sent me this great picture. I had given people an activity to do at home to write their sins on a slip of paper and then go outside and bury it in the earth and plant with it some seeds, some flower seeds, or, or a plant, a young plant, uh, to show how when we um, hand our sins or the things that we don't like about our lives over to God, God transforms them and brings forth new and resurrected life. So there's a photograph of little Adeline planting her prayers to God in the, in the dirt. And um, her mom says, yes, I want you to give your prayers to, to, to Jesus. And Adeline said, Jesus, I love Jesus. See, from the mouths of children, that photo of her um, digging in the dirt um, has stayed with me all week. Holy Thursday, we were not able to have our foot washing or our Seder or our Holy Thursday worship but I, I gave people activities to do at home. 
And so um, one married couple shared how they, how they did the washing of each other's feet and how it helped them to appreciate uh, the deep love they have for each other and God's love for them. A family of five, um, mom and dad and three teenage young adult boys all washed each other's feet in the bathtub. And a single man uh, sent me a text message saying how as he did the foot washing, he wept because he thought of did Jesus even wash Judas's feet? And I said, well, yes, of course he did, because God, who is love, always wins. Good Friday, we were not able to do our stations of the crosswalk, but we worshipped uh, and our young people shared beautiful songs about the cross that um, are on our website and our minister of music as well. Holy Saturday, we cannot gather for our vigil and have adult baptism, but we can gather together virtually and we can learn what the, it means that on that holy night, Christ passed over from death to new life and so we whom he loves can pass over with him from death to new life. Because, sisters and brothers, nothing can stop us from worshiping this day, this Easter Sunday, when we celebrate God who is love and that love which always has the final word of victory, which always wins. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so to, um, to bring that home in terms of some modern day illustrations, I'd like to share three, three stories. And the first is the story of my very first uh, Easter as an ordained pastor. My church was in rural Pennsylvania. I had just moved there. I had a, a, an infant, a newborn baby. Uh, I was nervous about doing my very first Easter sermon, and I felt like Mary Magdalene. I got up while it was still dark, and I walked through the dark streets of the town and then to the outskirts of town, um, literally to the tomb, to the, the town cemetery, which was on a hill. And there in the dark, in the dark, on my first Easter Sunday as a pastor, the trumpet blasted, and people who had gathered in the darkness sang, Jesus Christ is risen today, alleluia, and the trumpet played. And it was, it was like that love of God in Christ being almost defiant there in the midst of the tombstones proclaiming resurrection and new life because sisters and brothers god who is love is always victorious love always wins this um last week i talked with some friends from pennsylvania that i'm still close with and keep in touch with and it's two sisters um one i am friends with the other i just i just know through her sister and the ones I'm friend, the one I'm friends with is called Martha, and we'll call her sister Joanna. Those are not their real names. I have permission to share the story, but change the names to protect the identity. So Martha is a good friend, and she is a woman of deep faith. And she has, for many years, had a strained relationship with her sister Joanna. Um, who is not a person of faith and who often would even mock Martha or make fun of her for being a person of faith. One time they were out together in a pub, a bar that Joanna frequents, and Joanna said, well, hey, you have your church, you have your community. And she looked around at the, at the bar and the people in the bar and she said, this is my church, this is my community. 
And she said, you have your God. And she held up her drink for a toast and said, and I have mine. And Martha was so saddened by this, um, this the way her sister um, did not, um, you know, the way she looked at life and faith. But at the beginning of this year, this holy um, season of Lent, the 40 days of Lent, Martha said to me, um, Pastor Linda, um, you're not going to believe what happened. My sister, um, who struggles with cancer, um, they found a, a new treatment, but it's one that she has to go every day for treatment for guess how long. You guessed it, 40 days, just like the 40-day journey of Lent. So um, Martha's sister, Joanna, called her and said, Yes, I, I, I want to do this new treatment, but I, I'm not able to drive because this really wipes you out. And where am I ever going to find, you know, rides for 40 days in a row? And Martha, who was just contemplating what she would do for her Lenten discipline, said, I'll bring you. I'll bring you every day. So these two sisters um, go to their treatments every day. And over these 40 days of Lent... They began to mend their relationship. And then ironically, because of the coronavirus, the bar um, where Joanna went, where it, which was her church, of course, is closed. And, um, and so she said, you know, maybe it's a good time. The doctor's been telling me to, to stop drinking. Maybe it's a good time I stopped drinking. And so through this treatment for her body, but also the, the reconciliation with her sister, the giving up of her addiction, uh, Martha said, I don't know how this is going to turn out, if this is going to cure her illness, but I can tell you this, I do know this, it has brought about a complete transformation, a resurrection in her life because sisters and brothers God who is love will always win so many of us have been talking about how even through this horrible pandemic um, God as scripture says works all things together for good for those who love God God's able to bring something good even out of something horrible and tragic. And so a friend of mine from Church Beyond the Walls community, uh, Bev Pepe, said, you know, for years I have been praying, praying fervently for two things. And the first is that people acknowledge um, the deep interconnectedness of all beings and act accordingly, okay? And the second thing she's been praying for, she said, is for us to find a way to undo the damage we have done to this earth so that people and animals and sky and sea creatures and plants can all have a future together. Bev said, look, those two prayers are coming to fruition through this horrible situation we're living in. In fact, this week I had person after person talk to me about this whole experience as being a wake-up call to all of us to realize that we, as the human species, need to make a major paradigm shift and move into a new way of looking at life, a new consciousness. Um, Bev led a study group uh, focusing on the book by Richard Rohr, The Cosmic Christ. We need to shift into that Christ consciousness, that higher consciousness, whatever you want to call that. And we need to realize that um, the earth which is a living organism, which like every living organism, 
seeks self-preservation and survival. The earth has been crying out to us for far too long now about how we uh, have damaged it. And, and the earth is like revolting in these cataclysmic, um, devastating um, natural disasters. And perhaps now, even in this pandemic, ironically, um, with everything shutting down and people all homebound and quarantined and not able to travel, suddenly the, the earth is having a chance to like breathe again. It's having a Sabbath with all of the emissions. Um, the pollution has dropped drastically. And in a sense, the earth is beginning to heal because God, who is love, will always have the final word. In the Bible, one of the, the gospel in a nutshell, nutshell is John 3.16, God so loved the world. But in Greek, it's actually God so loved the cosmos that God gave God's only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so maybe through this wake-up call and this shifting of consciousness, my friend Bev's prayers will come too. We will realize as the ancient native peoples have said that life really is a web, this great web of life where we all are intricately connected. And what we do to one part of the web, we ultimately do to ourselves. So we will hopefully learn to live in a way that we will understand this deep interconnectedness with all beings and that we will begin to undo this damage we have done to the earth. For God does so love this earth. God does so love us. God does so love this cosmos. And God who is love, will always have the final word. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen.